Goedenavond iedereen. Good evening everybody. Erf Tov Le Koulam. On behalf of the Kaal Kadosh Talmud Torah, the Portuguese Jewish community in Amsterdam, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you. And a special welcome, of course, to our guest speaker, or should I say guest singer, Elliot Elderman. Elliot is a freelance musician, synagogue musician, much in demand as cantor and conductor at synagogues and Jewish communities across the UK and beyond. He currently serves as conductor in several synagogues. He also directs his own professional choral group, the Rina Ensemble, which is frequently asked to accompany many of today's top cantors for concerts, events, and special services. In 2009, Elliot was appointed director of music and in 2013, Chazam to the Spanish and Portuguese Jews congregation, our daughter, or as some say, sister community, Shangar Hashamayim in London. He's currently working on the complete edition of that synagogue's musical liturgical cycle, which will result in a publication and full set of recordings soon. But working for the daughter community, Elliot, of course means staying in touch with mom or sister here in Amsterdam. We are thrilled that we recently started the Modest Corporation. Tonight's seminar, as we discussed, will present an overview of the unusual and unique characteristics of the liturgical music of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews with a focus on our Kiela, our community here in Amsterdam. We are honored that all of you are joining tonight from several parts of the world, as I can see, and do hope that one day, God willing, we will be able to meet and pray together in our Esnoja with our one and only Koren Amsterdam Filot, which all of you should buy if you don't have it yet. Elliot, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, uh, and uh, I hope everyone can hear me now. Uh, it's um, it's a real pleasure to be invited to give this um, this uh, talk this evening. Um, it's a it's a pleasure to see so many of you um, joining us from all different parts of the world. I can see quite a few people that I know. Uh, it's nice to see some of your faces and and several of your names. Um, I hope that everyone will find something of interest here. Uh, we have in our audience, of course, quite a wide variety of, <clears throat> shall we say, levels of experience of the subject matter that we're going to be discussing. Some of you may be intimately familiar with it. Many of you are members of the of the uh, of the of the Kehila in uh, in Amsterdam and will know these melodies intimately. And others, for others of you, there may you may never have heard these, or you may only have heard a handful of them, or you may only have heard. Uh, um, bits and pieces on uh, <clears throat> on on YouTube. Uh, so I hope that uh, 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 everyone will find something that that, that they find of, of interest this evening. So we're discussing the music of the um, Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam, and to us to an extent some of the other congregations of the same species around the world. And I suppose a brief a brief historical introduction is in order. Um, for those of you who don't know, the the Portuguese uh, um, Jewish community in Amsterdam dates from sometime around the perhaps the very end of the of the 16th century or the beginning of the 17th century. <clears throat> and it was uh, the current community is a, a merger of three smaller communities which existed in Amsterdam around that time, the turn of the uh, 17th century. And uh, as, as I'm sure many of you will know, the community is formed of Anosim, or was formed of Anosim. That is, um, uh, Sephardi, primarily at least, not exclusively, but primarily of um, Sephardim who, uh, <clears throat> who uh, came from the uh, Iberian Peninsula um, at the time of the Inquisition uh, in the 1490s. Of course, you all know the, um, the, uh, the agents of the Inquisition and the governments in in Spain and Portugal, at different times, um, decreed that the Jews had to uh, had to had to leave um, those countries or or convert to to, uh, to Christianity. 
um, many many uh, of the of the uh, the Jewish uh, people at that time left and they formed the communities uh, around the various parts of the Mediterranean that we have today and some of which we don't have today anymore unfortunately uh, because of events in the middle of the 20th century uh, and some did not leave and some stayed in Spain and Portugal uh, and some converted to, uh, to Christianity um, others didn't convert but pretended that they had converted so that uh, you were left with a situation where there, are, there were adherents of the Jewish faith living under the yoke of the Inquisition and at constant risk of discovery and the Inquisition went to some lengths to discover who was secretly trying to remain Jewish um, and trying to maintain uh, Jewish practices in secret. There are stories of promulgations going out asking people to see, um, to, to, to report their neighbors if they had some, uh, some uh, uh, reason to suspect their neighbor might be Jewish. Maybe they would uh, offer them something to eat on the date that was known to be Yom Kippur. And if they refused to eat, then they would say, ah, maybe, maybe your neighbor is Jewish, you need to report them to the authorities. Um, or if you um, offer them uh, um, pork uh, to eat at any time of the year and they refuse to eat it, maybe they're Jewish and need to report it to the authorities. So this is just a very brief uh, uh, account of some of the things that these people were subject to and it got worse um, um, towards the latter part of the 16th century um, at which time and the beginning of the 17th century uh, and many of them uh, tried to leave and escape at that time and they went to various places in Europe uh, particularly Hamburg but primarily um, uh, also also in Italy there were some communities but uh, the, the of course the, the 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 primary community the one we're discussing tonight is the is the is the Amsterdam community so you have a situation where the original adherents of the the original members of the community excuse me are uh, are a um, hundred years or more uh, with no uh, Jewish community life uh, they had very limited knowledge of Hebrew, how to read and write Hebrew. They had very or non-existent knowledge, perhaps you could say, of uh, of, of uh, communal life, of uh, synagogue life in particular, because none of those things were allowed under the Inquisition, and they were in great danger if they tried to do any of those things. And therefore, they uh, in the early years of the community, they they re essentially requested. Uh, help. They needed uh, help uh, from the other communities around the Mediterranean, uh, which had left a hundred or more years previously to, to help set up their community in, to, in terms of Jewish education and setting up tefillah and all sorts of things that didn't have the expertise. Uh, and um, they had help from a number of uh, ministers that were and that were brought in at that time, who were who were who were recruited from uh, some of the other communities, uh, in particular Isaac Uziel. Um, who uh, around the very beginning of the 17th century came from Morocco. He was from Fez, I believe, uh, and he was a sort of rabbi minister, um, stroke cantor, we understand, who essentially, uh, it, it's attributed to him uh, the, um, the development of the uh, early development of the Minhag as we have it today. It's not 100% clear, but it's attributed to, uh, um, to, to a lot of his influence. Uh, and therefore, um, if you like, the, 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 uh, the, the material is coming in from communities like Morocco, uh, also there were ministers who came from Salonika, um, different Sephardic communities around the Mediterranean, but with a, 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 a congregation who didn't really know, uh, who didn't know how to speak Hebrew in, in many cases, who weren't familiar with the sort of Eastern Sephardi way of singing things, and therefore, um, uh, Uh, that the, uh, the the melodies that we have today came um, uh, became uh, some of them at least became westernized by, which uh, will be, what I mean by that will become clear later in the talk um, so now we have the community in the early 21st century and as it was in the in the 20th century and uh, the music of the community is unique it's really true to say it's unique there's no other um, community that's exactly the same and the only ones that are anything like it are the, the as 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 Michael uh, uh, called them the daughter or sister congregations uh, you have the Cambridge congregation in uh, in in London and the congregation in New York and there are a few others as well that are not perhaps um, quite as strong as they once were or don't exist anymore um, so 
apart from that affinity, uh, that family affinity, um, there's really, it's really unique. And the music, the music we have, I, I would say, falls into, in, in stylistic terms, falls into a number of a number of categories. Um, you have um, what you might call traditional chants, um, congregational chants, um, often or that is ones that the kahal will join in with, um, or or sometimes that the chazan will sing on his own, um, and some of those are very very similar to the way they're still done nowadays in in places like Morocco, for example, as we, since we were discussing Morocco. Uh, and in particular on Yamim Ra'im, on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, this is where you find that these uh, these tunes are very, uh, 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 very, very uh, similar to, to the way other Sephardi communities do them, um, with a few uh, uh, things here and there which uh, give away that it's not exactly the same. And then you have, uh, that's the first set, then you have other congregational chants or, or, or items which are sort of uh, which I'll discuss uh, more which will become com become what I would say I would call it westernized and then on the other end you have compositions that is you have pieces of music that were written in some cases we know who wrote them in other cases we don't know who wrote them uh, and they've been written for the congregation uh, it, uh, often for the for the chazan to sing on his own I'm thinking particularly of melodies for the Kaddish and the Kedusha, um, and often those are unique to Amsterdam, and, and uh, um, as I say, sometimes we know who wrote them, and the, the style of those, uh, I, I will, you'll hear imminently, because I'm going to begin the demonstration, it's enough talking already, uh, we're, going to, we're going to do a little bit of singing. So, um, I thought I would begin <clears throat> with an example of... Um, a very well loved melody from uh, from the uh, Amsterdam Portuguese tradition, which is Hamesiach. Um, this is uh, from Nishmat Kol Chai. It's actually sung on Simchat Torah uh, um, and also, I believe, Shabbat Bereshit. Uh, uh, I will double check that. Uh, yes, and Shabbat Nachamu. Um, Shabbat Nachamu is in the summer, uh, the Shabbat after Tisha B'Av is the anniversary of the the synagogue that is the anniversary of when it was first open and it become a very much a sort of like a celebratory shabbat with lots of special tunes and this one in particular is is sung there um and this uh, i'll i'll let it speak for itself and then i will speak a little about it after i've sung it uh, first i get the key technical glitch excuse me there's my starting note so this is Hamesiach. Hamesiach. <laughs> Ah. Uh -huh. 
אנחנו מודים, אנחנו מודים. I haven't done all the repeats in that. Um, could everyone hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up if you could hear me. That's a yes, okay. Um, I haven't got, there's, every section in that is repeated. So, uh, because uh, whatever, for time reasons tonight, I didn't, do, I didn't do all the repeats in that, but you get the idea. So this is taken, <clears throat> the source for this is a very interesting booklet, which uh, resides in the Etz Chaim Library in Amsterdam. This is the, uh, the library of the congregation. Um, and it's uh, written out, um, it's, a little, it's a little booklet. Um, it's written out by, uh, we believe, a, um, a chazana of the, uh, of the time, uh, of the, excuse me, the, um, the sort of the latter part of the 19th century. And the name is escaping me at the moment, um, but it will come to me, no doubt. Um, or if it doesn't, uh, the the name will the name the name will come to me later. Um, but anyway, this manuscript um, is a sort of Chazan's manual. It has a, it has a selection of seventeen or eighteen uh, pieces for the Chazan to sing. Uh, and uh, um, in comparison with uh, with other manuscripts, musical manuscripts which are held in the library, um, um, it bears a number of similarities um, to to music from the eighteenth uh, century. And some of you who are maybe more musically minded would have seen quite a lot of, uh, just, you know, what are the what are the characteristics of it? It's florid. It's got lots of runs where the singer's going up and down. You know, one syllable lasts. It could be five minutes on one syllable before you meet to the next syllable. It's got vocal, uh, this, what we call coloratura, um, uh, vocal fireworks, if you like, and it's really meant as a showpiece um, for the chazan. Uh, and what about the style? The style is Western. That means it's not if you compare it with, you know, the, the music that you might hear if you went to Morocco uh, and you went to a synagogue in Morocco uh, or you went to a synagogue in uh, Iraq, uh, if there were any synagogues left in Iraq, or you went somewhere in, in the Balkans at the time when, the, when, the, when the, uh, there were synagogues in the Balkans. It's a totally different style. It's, it's like Western, Western, i.e. Western European opera style. Uh, and that we believe that sort of style comes from the uh, from from the one particular part of the community, uh, and here I'm going to defer to um, my esteemed um, uh, uh, departed predecessor um, David Ricardo, who um, uh, is uh, um, the, the uncle of uh, your chairman Michael Minko, and I believe his his uh, his brother ben, uh, ben, uh, Benjamin is with us this evening. I can see his name anyway. Um, so I defer to um, to to David Ricardo, who um, was uh, Chazan, I believe, and choir master of the synagogue um, during the uh, the early part of the 20th century, up until he made Aliyah in the 1930s. And he had this wonderful book, which perhaps you can see here, Ma'im um, Zemirot which was published in 1975. Um, and it's, he, uh, he um, transcribes a lot of the melodies of the congregation. And his th thesis is that um, pieces of the type that, we, that I just sang for you uh, come from the Italian side of the community. In the early years of the community, they were joined by, by people coming from the Italian communities from Venice uh, and perhaps from Livorno and elsewhere. Uh, um, who brought their own uh, op Italian operatic style with them, and certainly a piece like that. Uh, so that that style, if you like, sort of welded itself into the into the fabric of the congregation, uh, and certainly a piece like that, even though it's more than 200 years later, we think, uh, that it was written since the community was founded, very much in that style. It really it really fits into that. So personally, I I, I agree with David Ricardo on that, but. As with many of these things in musicology, there isn't always a way to tell 100% to say that this is exactly what happened. Um, we don't know for certain. Um, so perhaps I can continue now um, with um, another uh, uh, an, an, another before we move on to another style. And the piece I had in mind uh, is um, a Kaddish melody, uh, which is from... Well, it's uh, listed as um, 
as being specifically for to be sung on the first evening of Pesach. Um, so, so this is another place in the liturgy where you find um, big showpieces for the Chazan to sing, um, long uh, uh, pieces with lots of with lots of florid um, notes for the Chazan to sing uh, um, and to show off his vocal abilities, and uh, particularly at points where, where you, in the service where you have Kaddish and Kedushah, often this is a this is a chance for him to show off. And it's also in the same sort of style, but you'll hear, um, you'll hear what I mean. So this begins with Michacham, the end of the psalm, the Passover psalm, Psalm 107. We sing at the beginning of the service before then singing Kaddish on the evenings of Pesach. Michacham. Ve <laughs> Kaddish for the first night of Pesach. <laughs> Thank you, I got a thumbs up from Danny. Thank you so much. Um, that, uh, at least as it appears in this same um, this same manuscript, whose name is still uh, escaping me. That's bothering me. Um, let's see if I can find the information. Otherwise, I'll be it'll be irritating me all evening, or maybe not. Oh, what is his name? Does anyone does, it, does anyone put it in the chat? Perhaps I can have a look at the chat. 
uh, maybe David, um, maybe David knows David Ricardo. If anyone can, uh, if anyone can remember who, um, who wrote that manuscript, you'll put me out of my misery. Um, anyway, the um, one new message. Um, the particular reason why that 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 one in, is a particular interest to me, although they're all of interest to me, these melodies, um, is that I my, this is my thesis now. Um, it's um, if we compare briefly, we move across the across the English Channel to London, across the North Sea. Uh, um, the London community is a daughter of the Amsterdam community, is for historical reasons that uh, I haven't got time to go into now. Uh, but um, it, uh, uh, many of the melodies are are, are are very very similar, but not necessarily the Kaddishim and the kids were shot. But this particular melody that I just sang, I uh, 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 I think it I, I think it's strongly related to the the melody that we sing in London for the first day of of, of Yom Tov. That is the first day uh, of each of the Shalosh Ragalim Pesach Shavuot and Sukkot, uh, and we sing it for the kid, but not for the Kaddish in the evening. We sing it for the kids in the morning. And I, I, you'll, I'll sing it to you, and you'll, you'll make your own decision how similar it is. And and it carries on in the same style. Um, so I won't sing any more of it, but you'll make your own decision whether you agree with my thesis or not. So that's a couple of examples of um, the, the very much Italianate Western style that we see in the synagogue. Now let's move on to one of the other styles. Um, and I'm going to give myself a small vocal break, if I may. Um, so the other sort of... I'll tell you what, I won't give myself a break yet because I want to do this a different way. Um, the other, one of the other sorts of, of sorts of styles of melody that I mentioned uh, was uh, this uh, the, the the ones that the, particularly the ones that are used for Yamim Noraim that is Rosh Hashanah and Kippur uh, that are uh, much more similar to the uh, to the Eastern if you like Sephardi way of say of singing things or the Moroccan style um, and various other uh, um, types of um, non Ashkenazi communities from that area the Middle East that area of the world and the and around the Mediterranean as well. Um, uh, so, so some uh, some examples of that. Um, I'm going to refer to David Ricardo's book here again, um, which is a very interesting resource. Um, maybe another time, if I have the opportunity, I'll talk more about what what David had to, had to do. Um, David Ricardo did, uh, which is a highly important uh, um, a, a set of work that he did in relation to this music. Um, but uh, what he writes here, so so he, for example, gives uh, for Yamim Noraim um, the Kaddish Shirab Tzibur Arvit Yamim Noraim. That is um, the, what, we, what we would call in English the congregational Kaddish. This is not something you find in any other community. Um, the idea that the, 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 that the congregation, uh, normally the Kaddish is, is, is said by an individual. Either it's the Chazan, it marks the sort of the end of one section of the service before carrying on with the next section. Um, and it's usually said by the Chazan, or in some cases it's said by uh, a mourner, someone who's in mourning for a, for a, a close a relative who passed away. Uh, uh, but in any case, one person. Here in the Portuguese community, you have this unique custom where on certain occasions, the entire congregation sings the Kaddish together and not the, uh, uh, well, the mourners as well, but only along with the rest of the congregation. Uh, and this is the, the melody that's used for that for Yamim Noraim in the evening. Uh, you'll forgive my paraphrasing. Um, I, um, I'm going to sing it with the Amsterdam melody, but the way the words would fit in London, um, for, for reasons uh, that you can ask me in private if you want. <laughs> Shemela ba 
בעלמדי ברחיל מוטה, וימליך מלכותה, ויצמח פור קנה, ויקרב משיחה, בחייכון וביומכון, וחיה דכל בית ישראל, בגלה ובזמן קריב. Amen. And there's two more verses of the same the same melody, and that is um, uh, what we would call a lachan. Uh, so uh, uh, it's you can hear it's it's totally different in style to the kaddish uh, the kaddishim that we did earlier and the hamesiach that we did earlier. Um, completely different style. Um, it's lachan. That is the melody of. Yedei Rashim or Ya Kashim Cha, which are piyutim that are sung at different points in the service on uh, uh, um, on the Yamim Noraim, uh, and they and this tune appears uh, many many times over the course of the Yamim Noraim, and here it's sung for the Kaddish in the evening. And if you uh, compare that with uh, with the way it's done in Morocco, it's practically the same. There's there's almost no difference whatsoever. Interestingly, in London, the way we would do that would be Yid Gadal ve Yid Kadash Shem Eraba ve Amadi Berachirute. And it goes off into the major sort of flight of fancy. Uh, I don't know how it, how it became like that, but it did. Now. Um, if we then go to uh, another of David's uh, Ricardo's transcriptions, the way he writes um, now the solo Kaddish, um, uh, also um, also for Yabim Noraim. So this is the Kaddish that the Chazan sings um, on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur at Shachrit in the morning service before Baruch Hu. So. Uh, uh, what he writes is, is as follows. Excuse me. on in the same melody and the first half of the Kaddish ends off and then and no prizes for uh, for seeing where this uh, where this melody comes from um it's the same as the uh, the lachan that we sang um, uh, a couple of minutes ago for the uh, the evening Kaddish, um, which I referred to as the um, Yudei Rashim melody, because that's the, uh, the the first piyut on Rosh Hashanah morning that, that uses that melody. <clears throat> so um, we have um, much more, sim uh, if you if you like musically at least, much more simple. Uh, it's you know, it's, firstly it's for the congregation to sing, um, so therefore uh, it's not uh, meant to be a showpiece for the chazan. And but also the style is 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 no is nothing like um, the uh, the other style uh, the other style that we've sung earlier. Now um, the assumption therefore is that um, is that this uh, these these types of melody uh, are the ones that come um, directly, if you can if you can say such a thing, uh, from Morocco. 
um, from the, the Chazan, the Rabbi Chazan Isaac, Isaac Uziel, who was um, who was uh, one of the the founding uh, minister of the community, if you like, uh, and um, as to why those ones are, are, are sort of maintain, um, I say maintain more similar to to the way they will be done in other communities. Who knows? Maybe maybe uh, the feeling was that for Yamim and Ra'im, uh, um, it's you know three very special days of the year, um, and uh, the, the the melodies have more uh, uh, more sort of. Uh, fixed quality to them that needs to be preserved from um, from generation to generation because they're very much associated with the prayers of those days. That's a supposition. Um, but it does seem to be um, even Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi communities have a similar concept in what they call Misinai melodies. Uh, um, they're not literally given at, at Har Sinai. They're not given at, at Mount Sinai. Um, but um, but they are considered so old um, that um, there's a, a selection of these melodies that are brought down by the Maharil, um, who was writing in the early part of the um, or the times of the Geonim, I think, towards the end of the first millennium CE, and he and he he brings a number of melodies that are so old that they're considered in in, in inseparable from Minhag Ashkenaz, and you must sing these melodies, otherwise you haven't followed the halakha. You, you you don't have a valid service if you don't sing these melodies if you're in an Ashkenazi congregation. So I wonder whether uh, some similar sort of concept um, occurred here. Who knows? Um, so. Uh, so now, then we have this other, um, this other, this sort of third um, type of melody that I was referring to, which kind of lies halfway between the two, where it's a sort of, um, uh, 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 excuse me, a congregational melody, um, a, a, what you might call a traditional melody. It's not one of these composed pieces um, uh, that we've been singing previously. Um, it's, uh, and therefore, when we say traditional, it means it's so old that we don't know who wrote it. Um, but as compared to how it's sung with other communities that sing a similar melody, it's done in a much more Western way. And the best way of describing what I mean by that is to give you some examples. So um, if we go to Kel Nora Alila, which is the um, everyone's, uh, of course, favorite piyot from, from Kippur, uh, right at the end of the uh, uh, of, of, of Yom Kippur, uh, the final service of the day is Nengila. And this piyut uh, kel nora alila um, begins the nengila service. And um, for co for contrast, um, uh, I'll sing it how it's sung in Morocco. Uh, it goes kel nora alila, kel nora alila, amsila nu mechila beshatanehila. Or if you're in a Yerushalmi Syrian congregation, it might be Kel Nora Alila, Kel Nora Alila, Ham Sila Numechina, Bishat Haneila. And now the Amsterdam equivalent um, for contrast. Kel Nora Alila. Kelenora and so forth, and it carries on in that melody. So where's the where's the affinity? It's the, it's the same tune, but it's done in a very different style. And if you think if you listen to the London version, it sounds even more sort of classical opera style. So we have, you know, it wouldn't, it's, it's, it's clearly the same fa family of melody is the contour of the melody, by which I mean where it goes up and where it goes down uh, uh, um, is, is, is the same, is in, almost indistinguishable across these versions, but the overall effect is very, very different. And for contrast, do I have time for another few minutes worth of, uh, yeah, um, I will, uh, yeah, that's a good, um, uh, um, if we take it to the extreme, um, I haven't really discussed the choirs yet. Each of the 
three sort of primary um, Spanish and Portuguese congregations has a choir uh, that sings at different times, different occasions. Not all of them sing. Some of them sing every Shabbat. Some of them sing Friday nights as well. Uh, um, in Amsterdam, the choir tends to only sing on special occasions, uh, festivals and special occasions. Uh, but in any case, um, the very idea of having a choir is Western uh, because you don't find, or at least you don't find choirs of the same type. Uh, um, in the in 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 um, Eastern music and Arabic type music, because they didn't develop um, harmony in the same way as the, as the Westerners did, without going into a whole thesis on on harmony. Um, but if you listen to Arabic music, the in, the the sort of if someone composes a piece in, the, in, a, in an Arabic style, what how they'll be judged uh, on how proficient they are as a composer stroke performer because they're the same in the Arabic tradition will be how interesting the rhythm is, um, how many um, interesting florid sort of vocal runs they do up and down, how they modulate from one lachan to an, uh, excuse me, from one um, from one lachan to another, one mode to another, um, but they don't have a concept uh, of harmony and in, in uh, because in, in, um, in Western music really the idea of harmony developed uh, developed around around the 13th century with the with the development of written music, um, that is written notated music. It's kind of like having the ability to draw a map. Um, if you don't have the ability to write down a map, how are you going to plan your route around uh, around where, wherever, wherever it is you've got to go? Once you have the ability to draw and to write down things, then you can like you can make a plan. You can say, right, I'm doing that bit there, this bit here. And then you have uh, uh, much more ability to do uh, to sort of plan things are happening at the same time, i.e., harmonies where you have one line singing like at the top, another line in the middle, another line at the bottom, and they're all singing together. So that's something that develops in the West. And so the very idea of having a choir at all is a Western is is a Western idea. Uh, you won't really find it in the in the uh, in the Arabic Eastern traditions, except maybe people singing in unison, nothing more. So. Um, we sang a couple of melodies for Kel Mora from the Amsterdam and um, and London traditions. So here, if I can share the audio, is um, is the equivalent in New York, um, where the choir has gone to the to the next extreme. And you'll hear one second. Mm -hmm. there you have uh, an example of um, how far this can go if you take a melody and uh, sing it in a in a Western style you can harmonize it as well in a Western style um, I still have a couple of minutes for one last item um, so since we've been talking about choirs let me go back to Amsterdam um, and give some examples of uh, the choir as it is and was in Amsterdam um, because there, as I alluded earlier, a couple of minutes ago, um, there was a choir, and there, there is still a choir called Santo Servicio. Um, that choir was uh, formed, I believe, in the 19th century. Um, but it never, and, and it, it was interrupted, understandably, during the Second World War and the Holocaust, and was reformed um, in the early 21st century. Uh, and the uh, and the current choir sings the, the musical scores as they were brought down from the 19th century. Uh, and there, the uh, uh, it's, 
it's it's very interesting. Whereas we heard just in New York, um, the the uh, the version of uh, Kel Nora sung in New York. Well, that's a congregational melody, or at least it's supposed to be a congregational melody. How many people uh, join in with the choir singing in like that? I don't know. They uh, haven't been there once or twice. I, they 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 do in general sit, uh, join in with it. Whereas in Amsterdam, the choir comes in for special occasions and it sings composed pieces which are not not meant for the congregation to join in with and now we're going back to the first style of music that i talked about where it's composed pieces pieces that were written in the western style for the community but in this case written for the choir to sing not for the not for the chazan and so here is uh, just one example um, from the, the cd re released a few years ago by santa servicio uh, uh, of um, of uh, uh, their version of Baruch Haba. It's called Baruch Haba New. It's by an anonymous composer. Um, I suspect it was by an Ashkenazi composer. There was collaboration uh, in the 19th century between the, the Ashkenazi and the Spanish and Portuguese communities um, in Amsterdam. <laughs> there because I think we have time to do all of it. I see um, Salvas Diaz has written correctly, the composer's name is Berlin. Yes, it is, it is a, a, um, a, in some sources I've seen it is, it is referred to as Berlin, in others it's, a, um, it's anonymous. So uh, if, we, if we assume it's Berlin, then I, I believe he was one of the collaborators that I alluded to. By the way, uh, I've reminded myself who wrote the manuscript. It's Pimentel. J, J. Enriquez Pimentel um, is the, uh, the um, the Chazan who um, who wrote the manuscript that cu currently uh, that currently resides in the Etz Chaim Library in Amsterdam that is this sort of manual for the Chazan of uh, a selection of different tunes um, and it's been made into a modern edition as well. Um, I think we've had our 45 minutes. I'm happy to uh, to uh, conclude um, or to sing one more tune maybe. Uh, so let's finish off. I'll sing one more tune um, and. Which one shall I choose? Uh, okay, uh, I'll go back to the um, to the the, um, the Western style of, of Chazanut compositions to close. Um, this will be the um, the uh, Kiddush, uh, um, uh, the kid, uh, ah, the um for Yom Tov. Let me just check which one I'm going to do. Yes, this is the Kiddusha for Yom Tov, which is done on Shalosh Regalim and appears in Piment, I believe it appears in Pimentel's manuscript. Don't quote me on that. It may not do. Let me unshare the audio. Uh, stop share. Right, there you go. So I'm still learning how to use Zoom. Excuse me. Okay, so Nakdishach, Kedusha for Yom Tov. As a final example. No. Ah, 
Siyah sor